Zombie makeup is one of the easiest types of makeup there is because when you're, it's all said and done, if you don't like the results, all you have to do is cover it in blood. That being said, I, I guess zombie crawls are a real popular form, uh, expression of the makeup right now. So I like to first start with the pre-story, is how long has that person been dead? Are they a fresh kill? Are they, do they linger and waste away slowly? Or are they a historical character, which can, which can be great fun. You have someone in a Civil War outfit or who's seriously decayed. So that's a lot of fun. So the pre-story is really where it all starts. And you just start looking at it. You know, if they're you know, fresh kill, then you've got lots of blood. And then you, you know, or they've been dead for a month, and there's bloating and swelling and puffiness. And it just goes from there, and it's just the story that you tell in your head. I, I try and keep them in my head because it sounds a little kooky sometimes when I'm working. So, th and I've just always loved them. I got my first monster. I got my first book in first grade. It was a scholastic book called Monsters, Monster Makeup, and How to Do Them. I played with that so much that in second grade, my aunt came to the stage door and bought me a Stein's theatrical makeup kit which is eventually the company that was bought out by Zizos, which, which I now currently own. So I've been, you know, had long, long ties to the, to the company here and loved doing monster makeup, which has then evolved into all types of makeup. But I'd say monsters and disaster simulation are still two of my absolute favorite types of makeup. So I, I, like I said, I tend to keep the backstory to myself as I'm doing a zombie. So some of them, like I did, I did Urson Black, makeup. He's a little, very energetic young man who didn't like the airbrush at all, and he closed his eyes and squinted very, very hard, which was what made a really great effect then when he opened his eyes, and that it gave this very, very jagged lines around his face. And then from there, I think I just then finished it off by taking a stipple sponge. It would be like a sponge you'd use to clean your fish tank, and I think I just smeared some makeup on it and then made scratch marks all over his face, as I remember. So a lot of times it just, uh, the character presents itself out of necessity. And then other times, I'm trying to think who it was. I did a guy for, the, for a zombie crawl who had a thick beard and wild hair. So the only thing that really showed was his eyes. And I looked at that and I immediately knew it was just that his eyes were bleeding. And that was the only thing, because that was his only feature he had that made him human. He could have been, he was just a fur, if, if he doesn't have his eyes. So I had to make those, and the, most cre the creepiest thing I could do was make his eyes bleed. So a lot of times it evolves out of that. Um, one of my favorite things, though, to do is I take pretty women and make them disturbing. So it's like uh, gashes and cuts. Or if I had given the chance of a veil, underneath a veil is a wonderful place to leave something scary because then they can be look perfectly normal and drop the veil and be something horrifying. So everybody kind of, and sometimes I get a person who's got a very round face and with a lot of highlight and shadow, I can take that roundness and exaggerate it, and that will give a bloated and puffy appearance. And other people are very skinny naturally, and that will lend itself to a, a more wasted or wasting away look. So I try and work with what the person brings with them already, or maybe an outfit, or did they just get off work, because that can turn into an industrial accident then, which is just wonderful. Figure out your budget, and go and buy your makeup then start playing with it. If, if you, anybody can achieve just great results. There was a great book, actually the second makeup book I got, I was 10 years old, I got Dick Smith's Do-It-Yourself Monster Makeup. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Dick Smith is the makeup artist that did The Exorcist. And he made these wonderful, he had this book, and then he also put these molds that you could put glycerin and gelatin in. And they're still made by the Alcone Company to this day. But I had those as a kid, and this book is still available. It's a, a library has it, and it's how to make things out of stuff out of your kitchen. That's when I s started disturbing people. I, when I was 10 years old, I started doing the stuff out of the Dick Smith book, and people were disturbed. They looked at it and thought that I was really injured, that I was really hurt, that I really had a burn. And there's just wonderful stuff in there on how to do things with gelatin and breadcrumbs, and then maybe like duo eyelash adhesive. You really wouldn't even need a theatrical supply house for that type of makeup. So that's a great way to start. I, I sell that regularly to kids and parents and even art teachers. But then on top of that, you can just get some basic, even grease paints, clown makeups. When applied lightly, make wonderful bruises. The reds and the blues make wonderful bruises. And yellows can make that creepy healing color you get on the edge of a bruise. So I would just, my recommendation to people want to do it is just buy some and try it. It's a lot easier than it looks. What about like rotted flesh or dried blood? What, what's good to do that that somebody could maybe grab out of the kitchen? 
So if you want the rotted, the skin effects is really pretty easily a, a done with gelatin. And you can even, I'm sure, find the recipe on the internet. It's just ge uh, gelatin, even Noxon flavored gelatin just with water. Makes wonderful gory effects. And then mixed with glycerin, it won't dry and crack. You can actually wear it all day. And I don't remember, I think it's one pouch of the Nox unflavored gelatin with one tablespoon of glycerin, which you buy at the grocery store. It's in the first aid aisle. And that does some wonderful, like, it's almost latex like in its effect. In fact, in Hollywood, that's what they used before they had latex, was gelatin. I don't know if anyone remembers the old movie Marathon Man with Dustin Hoffman, but there's a scene where they cut off his pinky. And that was, cut, that was cast out of gelatin. That was gelatin and glycerin. That's all that was. Covered up with foundation. So I mean, it was a very, very effective makeup still to this day. So to achieve a skin tone for a zombie is a, a sallow green tends to be one of my favorite colors. But what you're really trying to do is neutralize any of the healthy colors. And healthy in most people is a pink or golden tone. So a green very, very quickly nullifies that. And on deeper skin tones, so as I get into, you know, someone from East India or from Africa, blues I find to be much more effective because you're really trying to drop out that golden color. So it's somewhere between green and blue is the t are the colors that I start using. I also find splotchy makeup. If you look at injuries up close, which you, people naturally don't do, there's actually wild color variations. So an even skin tone is a sign of being healthy. A splotchy skin tone is, is where it starts getting unhealthy. So I pick a skin tone, I, I look at their skin tone and how I'm going to neutralize the healthy colors that are in there. And I just work at neutralizing them in a very splotchy and irregular fashion.